Welcome to Thrive Church Online. My name is Kathy and I'm going to be your online host for today. If it's your first time here, you are VIP, so please let us know by texting you at 604-285-5770 and we will mail you your very own Thrive stainless steel water bottle. Parents, don't forget to go to mythrive.info slash thrivekids to access the Thrive Kids Summer Curriculum. So there you can find a worship video, a lesson video, a resource sheet that you can download, print, and do with your kids, and Zoom classes every Sunday from between 10.45 to 11.15 a.m. So we love a proactive church, so why don't you let me know if you're a dog person or a cat person in the chat room or if your neighbor beside you. So I am definitely a cat person because I don't have to take my cat out in the morning to pee or poo. So are you a cat person or a dog person? Let us know in the chat room or with your neighbor. Awesome! So we love to see your beautiful faces, so take a selfie of yourself tuning in today and post it on your social media using the hashtag ThriveChurchOnline. So, are you ready for today's message? I'm now going to pass the time over to Pastor JB and I'll see you all later. Hello everybody and welcome to Thrive Church Online. My name is JB and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to an amazing Sunday where we can draw near to God together. And if this is your first time here, guess what? You are what we call our VIP and we wanna give you a massive welcome and say we're so glad that you joined us today wherever in the world you may be watching the service. In fact, for all of our VIPs, our first time guests, we've got something very special to give to you. If you go to mythrive.info and you press the button that says new to thrive or you text the word new to 604-285-5770. We want to give you your very own Thrive Church stainless steel water bottle just as a way to say thanks so much for joining us today. I use my water bottle every day and just a simple way for us to say thanks so much for taking a Sunday to be with us today. In fact, we have a saying here at Thrive, which is that welcoming is not just what we do, it's who we are. And so with that in mind, we just welcome one another today in your chat rooms right now. To all the people in your chat room, would you welcome another? If you're sitting beside someone, would you give them an air high five? or a real high five, an air handshake, or a real handshake, an air hug, or a real hug, depending on whatever is appropriate, and want you to welcome one another to church today, wherever in the world you're watching the service, let's welcome one another to church on this very, very special Sunday. You guys are an amazing church, and you guys are beautiful inside and out. And I want to let you know, for those of you here for the first time, that here at Thrive Church, we exist for five purposes. And if you want to know what those five purposes are, I'm going to get our entire church online to help me with this. And church, I need your help for this. If you don't help me in the chat rooms right now, this is going to be a really awkward moment. And so get your finger typing, your typing fingers ready right now as we go through this, because I'm not going to give you a cheat sheet. Today, would you tell me right now, today, I want to hear you, hear you from, hear from you especially at Thrive Church, we exist for five purposes called A-E-I-O-U. And let's go through each one. What does A stand for? A stands for, right in the chat room, A stands for, and what does it mean? It means we're here to, okay, I can't see the chat room, but I hope you're writing it in there. A stands for alive. It means we're here to, and I'm going to show you the answer in just a bit. E stands for expectant. Yeah, that's right. Hopefully you're writing that in. And expectant means that we're here to write in the answer. We're going to show you the answer in just a minute. But what does expectant mean? Church, tell our VIPs here in this place what it means. I stands for, what does it stand for? It stands for involved. And what does involved mean? It means, write it in there. Help me right now. Help me, help me out right now, church. And then what does O stand for? O stands for out loud and what does out loud mean out loud means that we're here too Okay, I think you know it. I think you people are writing in there. Good job, those of you writing it in. Excellent. And finally, U stands for united. It means we're here to I'm not going to give you an answer, but I'm going to give it to you in just a minute. But if you know it, church, write it in there. Let everyone else know about it. And our dreams build a church of 
think you've got it. I think you've got it. Okay, here, let's look at, let's look at our cheat sheet right now. Here we go. Okay, we're going to show it to you on three, two, one. Okay, here we go. Let's read this out together right, loud, right now in a big, loud voice. We're going to say, here at Thrive Church, we exist for five purposes called A-E-I-O-U. A stands for alive. It means we're here to worship Jesus. E stands for expect. It means we're here to grow into Christ-like disciples. I stands for involved. It means we're here to serve God with our talents. O stands for out loud. It means we're here to lead others to Jesus. And U stands for united. It means we're here to love our spiritual family called God's church. And our dream is to build a church of 10,000 AEIOU leaders in the city of Vancouver and all around the world. Oh, come on. Give God a big, big hand here in this place right now. Praise God. That's our dream. That's our vision. And we're so glad that you're here as part of the Thrive Church online today. A little big thank you to each and every one of you who donated last week to a very special cause as we gave a portion of our offerings last week to uh, a, a very special organization called the Humanitarian Coalition, which is geared toward helping people right now in Beirut, the over 300,000 people who are without homes, without shelters, who are in desperate need for food, medical attention, water. And so because you guys gave, you are making a difference in places around the world, in like places in, like, in Beirut. Let's uh, continue to pray for the people of Beirut believing that God's heart is for every single person on this planet, regardless of their background, their culture, wherever they are in this world. If you believe that, say amen. You guys are a generous church, and I want to thank you guys for all the ways that you gave. And we'll give you more details uh, about how you can continue to give, but I want to let you know something today is that this coming September 1st, Tuesday, September 1st, is a very special day for here for us here at Thrive Church. And let me tell you why. It's because September 1st, we are doing our very next church-wide fast. Yes, that's right. It's our next church-wide fast. Could you give God a big hand and big shout in this place right now? All right. Praise God. You might be wondering, wow, why are you guys, why are you guys clapping because you can, don't get to eat? Well, the fact is this, is that our church-wide fast is one of the most powerful things we've ever done here at Thrive. And it's one of those things where we've seen, seen God move powerfully when we go out of our way to take time to draw near to God, sacrificing our meals so that we can spend time praying and drawing near to God. We've seen God work so powerfully powerfully in the lives of individual people here at Thrive, in the lives of families and homes here in our church family, and also as a big church family. We've seen God, we've seen God do some amazing things, taking us to another level whenever we've done our church-wide fasts, and we're getting ready for the very next one as well. And if you're here in this place and you could use a breakthrough, or you could use a touch from God as you enter into a brand new season of life in September, or you just want to make more room for God in your life right now, can I encourage you to sign up for our church-wide fast happening on Tuesday, September the 1st. You know, in the past, we've you know done, done different kinds of fasts. We've you know fasted you know, six days, three days, two days. Today or this time, we're going to do a one-day fast because we want to get as many people involved as we can. And if you've never fasted before, this is an amazing, awesome way to get acquainted with the idea of fasting. Uh, one day is not that bad at all, but it's enough for us to give God some room to do things that maybe we wouldn't otherwise give him room to do, and we want to give God that room this coming September the 1st. And so I want to encourage you to go to mythrive.info and to sign up for our church-wide fast. And when you sign up, we're going to give you a guide to fasting, which will give you all the information you need to know how to fast safely in a healthy way and also in an effective way. And so if this is your first time fasting, you've never fasted before, I encourage you to join us. If you fasted with us before, I encourage you to join us again, because it's going to be an amazing time to seek God's face together. If you believe that, say amen. 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 So look forward to, you can go to mythrive.info even right now and sign up for our church-wide fast. And we look forward to you joining us together. In fact, we're going to be breaking fast together, together on Zoom. We're going to be breaking fast together on that Tuesday night, September the 1st. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a fantastic time together. Well, we're going to get into the message right now. If you brought your Bibles, it's time to get that out. This is my Bible. It's a paper Bible. Maybe yours is a phone or a device you downloaded the Bible into. Maybe it's a computer. If you can, would you just hold up your Bible in the air like this right now? Could you do that right with me right now? Awesome. That's great. 
awesome. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can point to my Bible or someone else, uh, someone else's Bible. This is just a fun way for us to get our hearts ready for the message today. Could you say this together with me right now? It's on the screen. Let's say, this is my Bible. It is God's word. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I open up my heart so that God's word can come in and change my life. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're doing a series here at Thrive. It's called Pivotal Moments. It's because here at Thrive, we believe that every moment matters. Every day counts. But the fact is this, when you look back at your life, you might find that there's certain moments that tend to have this longer lasting impact on our lives. That when you made that decision or someone made that decision for you, when you moved from one place to another, when you said yes to that person or that opportunity, or when that door closed, that because of that moment, that pivotal moment in your life, that because of that, your life hasn't really ever been the same, for good or for bad or for whatever. And the thing is this, is that in this series called Pivotal Moments, we are asking different speakers to come and to share from their lives about times when they had to make a tough decision, where it was a pivotal moment for their lives. And we want to ask them to share about that story, about what that experience was like, and what some of the lessons they learned going through that situation. And I want to give a big thank you to all of our speakers so far who've done a wonderful job of, of just courageously sharing their stories from their lives. Today is certainly no exception. Today we've got Pastor Bon Merisigan, and he is here to share his story with us. Pastor Bon Merisigan is such a dear friend of ours here at Thrive. The fact is, we wouldn't be here on the site that we're in today without Pastor Bon and his church, World Harvest Church, that he was the pastor of for many, many years. And we want to always give him so much thanks and credit for allowing us to even be here. It was their hospitality, their generosity, their incredible hearts that welcomed us when we were still a Saturday night church meeting on Saturday nights and they welcomed us with open arms into this building and they allowed us to call this place our home because you know every family needs a home a church is not a building a church is the people but a, every family needs a home and a church needs a building and they gave us access to the building which we're in today and we're so incredibly grateful and so because of that and also because he's here to share a powerful message with us today would you give a huge huge, massive, warm welcome to the one and the only, Pastor Bon Marisigan, as he brings the message to us today. Oh, come on, give God a big hand. Let's give Pastor Bon a big hand as he comes up to the stage right now. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor JB, for that wonderful, awesome introduction. Good morning, Thrive Church. I'm happy to be back. Good morning. There. It is always a great blessing and privilege to bring God's word to the Thrive family. I pray that all is well with each and every one of you despite the ongoing pandemic, but know this, that God is sovereign. Our God is always in control, and no matter what happens, our lives are always in His hands. Can you say amen from where you are? Amen. amen. Our passage of scripture for today comes from the book of John, chapter 11, where we find the story of how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus lived with his sisters, Mary and Martha, in a place, in a village called Bethany. Now, I am sure we can all agree that the raising of Lazarus from the dead was a turning point in their lives. And based on the last verses of the previous chapter, which is John chapter 10, we find that Jesus and his disciples were in a place called Bethabara. It was the place where John the Baptist had preached and performed water baptisms. So Bethabara was 30 kilometers away from Bethany, which was a day's walk. Again, Bethany is where Lazarus and his two sisters live. Now John 11:5 says that Jesus loved this family. As a close friend of the family, Jesus most likely spent time with them whenever he was in Jerusalem, which was only two miles away from where they lived. Now, if we were to break down this chapter into sections, it would look like this. The first 16 verses talks about the death of Lazarus. Jesus received a message from Mary and Martha saying that Lazarus was sick. And then Jesus waited for two days before leaving for Bethany. And then Jesus arrived at Bethany, but it was too late. Lazarus had already been dead for four days. And then verses 17 to 37, it says that Jesus gave comfort to the sisters of Lazarus. This is where Jesus and Martha had a back 
and forth conversation which revealed and emphasized the identity of Jesus Christ. And we shall touch on this later on. Verses 33 to 37 say that when Jesus saw Mary and her friends weeping, it says Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and he was troubled. And the next verse, verse 37 says, Jesus wept. This is the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus cried because he loved his family. He had a personal relationship with them and he felt their grief. And then verses 38 to 44 talks about how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. It is here where we see Jesus arriving at the tomb of Lazarus. And he ordered that the tomb of Lazarus, the stone that sealed the tomb, be taken away. But Martha made a comment saying that th there would be such a bad, rotten smell. Because at this point in time, the body of Lazarus would have already been in a state of decomposition for four days. So there was no doubt that Lazarus was dead. Anyway, the stone was taken away. Then Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And surely enough, Lazarus came out. Lazarus had been raised from the dead. We can learn many lessons from this whole chapter, which goes all the way to verse 55 and partly into the first few verses of John chapter 12. But there are three life lessons that I'd like us to take away this morning. And my prayer is that we will apply these valuable principles in our daily lives. The first principle is this. Jesus loves and cares for his friends. One of my favorite Christian songs is Waymaker. How many of you love the song Waymaker? Say amen. Amen. There's a portion in that song that says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop? Working. working. Can everybody say working? working? And this is so, so true. But a lot of times we do not live this truth. When we don't feel or see that God is moving in our midst, sometimes we conclude that God does not care for us, that God does not love us. And this is what all the disciples of Jesus thought because of what Jesus did. Or should I say, because of what Jesus did not do. When Jesus received the news from the messenger, this is what verses 5 and 6 say. It says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, what did he do? He stayed where he was two more days. Verse 5 states how much Jesus loved his family. And yet verse 6 seems to contradict verse 5. When we learn that a loved one, say a family member who lives in another country or another province is seriously ill and we know that God might be taking them home anytime soon, the first thing we do is book the first flight out of Vancouver. Right? Why do we do this? Because we love our family. We want to spend time with a sick relative as well as be with other family members during these difficult times. Verses 5 and 6 would have sounded better if they had read, Jesus loved his family. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he immediately, can everybody say he immediately? He immediately left for Bethany. This would have been the logical thing to do, the sensible thing to do. This is what I would have done. This is what you would have done. But even though this is not what Jesus did, still, Jesus deeply cared for this family. Other verses in our story where it seems Mary and Martha thought that Jesus did not care for them can be found in verses 21 and 32. In verse 21, Martha said, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then in verse 32, Mary said exactly the same thing. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's as if Mary and Martha were saying, Lord, did you not receive the message? We sent you a messenger four days ago telling you that Lazarus was seriously ill. How come you did not immediately come to Bethany to save your good friend Lazarus? Lord, why did you delay? Finally, the thought of Jesus not caring for Lazarus 
and his sisters was vocalized, it was verbalized by other people. In verse 37 it says, But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of this blind man have kept this man from dying? So Jesus had a, a great reputation. People knew that he could heal the sick, the blind. And yet here they were, wondering if Jesus really cared for Lazarus. Many times because of fear or the pain in our lives because of difficulties or hardships that we go through, we tend to say words like this, words that accuse Jesus of not caring enough for us. I remember a story in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus and his disciples were on a boat. They were crossing the Sea of Galilee. And it so happened that a violent storm overcame the boat. There were waves, water coming into the boat. And this caused the disciples to fear for their lives. So what do they do? They woke Jesus up, who happened to be sleeping the whole time. They woke Jesus up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Right? These were the people closest to Jesus. And yet we see them kind of doubting if Jesus really cared for them. Right? The disciples did it. We do it. It's human made nature. Can everybody say it's human nature? But here's what is true. Regardless of how we think or feel, here is what is true. John chapter 15, verses 13 to 15 says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So the word friend is mentioned here three times. Jesus laid down his life for us sinners, and if we have received him as our personal Lord and Savior, and if we walk in obedience to his words, Jesus said, I call you my friend. How many of you are friends of Jesus? Raise your hands. Say amen. amen. And you know what? No one can outdo Jesus when it comes to loving and caring for his friends. The second principle that we can take away this morning is Jesus fulfills his promises. Can everybody say Jesus fulfills his promises? As soon as Jesus heard about the sickness of Lazarus, he could have healed Lazarus from far away. We all know that distance, nor anything else for that matter, can stop Jesus from doing whatever he wants to do. Why? Because Jesus is God. In an earlier story in John chapter 4, Jesus was in Cana where he performed his first miracle. He turned water into wine. And in Cana, it is from there where he healed the son of a royal official who was 30 kilometers away. The son, the boy, was in Capernaum, and Jesus was in Cana. Jesus could have healed Lazarus from a distance, but you know what? He chose not to. It wasn't the right time, and it was not how Jesus wanted to make Lazarus whole again. There is one thing that many people do not know about this story. You see, when the messenger first came to deliver the bad news to Jesus, it was on that day that Lazarus died. Some of you are probably scratching your heads, but let's do the math. It will become obvious. On day one, Jesus received a message regarding the illness of Lazarus from a messenger who traveled one day from Bethany to Bethabara. On days two and three, Jesus decided to remain where he was which was in Bethabara. On day four, Jesus arrived in Bethany, and we read that Lazarus had already been dead for four days. What does this mean? It means that Lazarus died four days ago, which was on day number one, which is when the messenger delivered the bad news to Jesus Christ. So had Jesus left <clears throat> for Bethany on day one, Jesus would not have seen Lazarus alive. Maybe Jesus delayed his arrival at Bethany so that by the time he raised Lazarus, four days after his death, 
there would be no room for doubt. There would be no room for dispute that Lazarus had already died. And the hope was that it would cause people to believe not only in the miracle, but also in Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 11, verse 23, Jesus made this promise to Martha, your brother will rise again. And sure enough, Jesus fulfilled this promise. Jesus fulfills his promises and is able to do so because of who he is. And there are several verses in our story this morning that reveal this. They reveal who Jesus is. In verses 25 and 26, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. This was a bold claim, but Jesus proved this with action. And Martha looked at the resurrection as an event, but Jesus told her and proved to her that the resurrection is a person. The resurrection is himself, Jesus Christ. And when it comes to life, specifically eternal life, Jesus was saying that eternal life comes by having a personal relationship with Jesus. The bottom line is there is no resurrection apart from Jesus Christ. There is no eternal life in heaven apart from Jesus Christ. If you believe that, say amen, church. Amen. And then in verse 27, Martha said to Jesus, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. You know, Martha said this, and Jesus did not deny it. Jesus Christ is the Messiah who, as foretold by the Old Testament, would come into this world and save his people so that whoever believes that he died for them on the cross would be saved and have eternal life in heaven. And Jesus is the Messiah. And Martha also said that Jesus is the Son of God. And even while Jesus was still in Bethabara, Jesus already told his disciples that he was the Son of God, which meant that he was of the same nature as God, therefore proclaiming that he was God. Church, can you repeat after me? Jesus is God. Louder, Jesus is God. Amen. Jesus is able to fulfill all his promises because of who he is. He is God. And as for delaying his departure for Bethany, it is not because Jesus wanted to practice social distancing from Lazarus because Lazarus was sick. When Jesus was still on earth, he spent a lot of time with the poor, the sick, the lepers whom we know were contagious, the blind, the outcast of society. Jesus did not and does not practice social distancing. Amen? Amen, church? Jesus loves to be with people. And what proves that is he died for everyone. And although we, um, although we know that Jesus does not, did not practice social distancing, church, as a reminder, we need to practice social distancing. We need to be responsible citizens, not just of Canada, but of the world. And even though we're practicing social distancing, we do not have an excuse not to share the gospel with those who need to listen to it and accept Christ as their Savior and Lord. There's many, many ways we can share the gospel. You can pick up the phone, Facebook Messenger, Zoom, whatever. There is no excuse not to share the gospel even during times of pandemic. Church, can you say amen? Amen. So, the reason for the delay in Jesus' departure to Bethany can be found in what Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 4. It says, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory. God's Son will receive glory because of it. And this leads us to our third and final lesson for today, which is, Our lives are meant to give glory to God. Jesus received glory. Jesus was exalted when he resurrected Lazarus from the dead. This was the greatest miracle of Jesus before he went to the cross. And because of this miracle, many people 
and we, you can read this in verse in John chapter 12, many people made an effort to see Lazarus in person because he was living proof. He was living evidence of the power and the glory of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what it was like to be in Lazarus' shoes? Being raised from the dead changed Lazarus' life forever. And while there were many who believed in Jesus because of this miracle, there were others who chose not to believe in Jesus. So listen, everyone believed that Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, but not everyone believed in Jesus Christ. There's a difference there. Now the religious leaders decided to have both Jesus and Lazarus killed. I mean, these were religious people, right? And yet here we see them wanting to commit murder. They wanted Jesus dead because they needed to protect their selfish interests. Jesus was bad for their money-making business, but that is a whole other sermon by itself. They also wanted Lazarus dead because Lazarus was living proof of the power, the glory, and the divinity of Jesus Christ. So there will be people who will choose to believe in Jesus, and there will be people who will choose not to believe in Jesus, but in the end, God gets all the glory. Church, repeat after me. God gets all the glory. If you believe that, say amen. So this is the story involving Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, as well as those who chose to believe in Jesus and those who chose to reject Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you another story, and I know you guys love stories because uh, stories are easy to remember. Jesus taught in parables. And so my hope is that you can learn from the story of Lazarus and my story as well. And this story is very recent. So it's fresh from the oven. And it highlights the same lessons we learned from John chapter 11. My wife Arlene had spinal nerve issues in her lower back for almost two years. And this caused her to have chronic pain. Chronic means ongoing non-stop and this was excruciating pain in her lower back and both legs god led us to make the decision for her to undergo spine surgery which is considered to be major major surgery the spine surgeon told us that only one percent of her patients who undergo surgery would experience post-surgery complications and so on may 6th my wife Arlene underwent spine surgery and based on the surgeon's timetable, my wife should have been out of the hospital in five days. But five days turned into 30 days. God's timetable for my wife was different. My wife was in that 1%. She experienced several post-surgery complications and needless to say, she was in a lot of great discomfort and pain for three weeks after the surgery. One of the major complications was that my wife's blood pressure would not stabilize. It would fluctuate. She could only stand up for a few seconds. She could not even begin her physiotherapy treatment at the hospital because she would experience severe dizziness. She could not stand up for a long time. Even following the, the finger of the doctor as it moved from left to right, that would make her dizzy. It would make her want to vomit. The spine surgeon, several neurologists, several eye, ear, nose, throat doctors, they could not figure out why my wife experienced complications. All of these doctors went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, like a ping pong ball for one and a half weeks, right? And don't get me wrong, we all love doctors. I believe that God uses doctors and medicine to bring healing into people's lives. But after one and a half weeks, you know, after consulting one another, they ran several tests during those one and a half weeks. And all the while, my wife was in great discomfort and in pain. And just like the disciples and Mary and Martha, who wondered why Jesus did not immediately rush to Bethany to heal Lazarus, in the back of my mind, I was asking Jesus, Lord, why are you prolonging my wife's agony, my wife's pain, my wife's suffering? Jesus, why are you delaying? 
my wife's healing. And to make matters worse, my wife was all alone in the hospital during the entire month of May and partly into June because of COVID-19, right? No visitors, no family friends were allowed to visit patients in the hospital. So I wasn't able to be with my wife during this difficult time. Yeah, sure, there was Facebook Messenger, right? I mean, that was obviously a blessing, but it's really different when you are there for that person. Now, as a Christian, I knew that my wife would be healed in God's perfect time. I knew that all things work together for good to those who love God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Like Mary and Martha, my faith was intact, but I wondered what God's purpose was, what God's specific plan was for my wife. So three weeks after my wife's first surgery, the doctors decided to operate on my wife a second time. And to be opened up a second time was a big deal. This was serious. I mean, the wounds from the first surgery, they were already starting to heal. And here we received the news. We're going to open you up a second time. My wife and I just cried when we received this news, but we sought comfort in the Lord. We believe that God, Jesus, saw us weeping. And I believe Jesus wept. We believe that Jesus cared greatly for my wife and that no matter what happened, no matter what happens, Jesus was going to see her through this. We knew that Jesus would fulfill his promises of healing my wife. And we also had literally hundreds of people all around the world praying for my wife. Our local church in Vancouver, our big church in the Philippines, other friends and relatives scattered all across the world. Everyone was praying for my wife. So the spine surgeon cut open my wife's back once again. She took out a few bones from the spine. She looked inside. She looked and looked and looked. Only to find nothing. Nothing was wrong. So the spine surgeon closed my wife's lower back and immediately called me to say that they could not find the cause of the problem. My faith was tested once again. What now, Lord? What now? How could this possibly reveal your glory? And because the surgeon could not fix my wife, I mean, will my wife have to spend another two weeks, one month, two months at the hospital? I mean, in the end, I brought the situation once again to Jesus Christ. But I'll be honest with you. I would go to sleep crying. I would cry myself to sleep. Why? Because it broke my heart to have my wife to be in this situation. Many times I've cried, Lord, I'd rather take my wife's place. But we know that it doesn't work like that, right? So one and a half days after the second surgery, my wife finally woke up, right? The effects of the drugs, anesthesia from the second surgery you know, they started to wear off and she was a little bit coherent. She called me on Facebook Messenger and said to me, all the blood pressure complications that I've been feeling, it's all gone. It's disappeared. And I said, praise the Lord. You are healed. And then my wife also said that the spine surgeon was very direct and very honest with her and told her that she had no explanation. Can everybody say, no explanation? She had no explanation as to why my wife got healed. The surgeon could not explain, but my wife and I and all the believers that had been praying for my wife knew exactly what had happened. God intervened. God healed my wife. God revealed His glory. And God used my wife's condition to show the doctors and all our friends that God cares, that God is our healer, that God is our miracle worker, that God is a way maker, that God is our promise keeper. And sometimes God fulfills His promises in the way we imagine He would. 
I'm not done yet, but let's give God a clap offering. I mean, God deserves all the praise and all the glory. Thank you, Lord, for my wife's healing. To you be the glory, Lord. This miracle was a major turning point in our lives because God healed my wife in such a way that it was clear to everyone that what had happened was not a result of the doctors. It was not a result of medicine. This was definitely a no doubt it was a Jesus miracle. Amen? Just like the raising of Lazarus from the dead was a no doubt it was a Jesus miracle. Aside from becoming a Christian, this healing was definitely the biggest miracle in our lives. And as a result, my wife's faith and my faith, my children's faith, is much, much stronger than ever before. And we will never, ever be ashamed to tell everyone that Jesus is willing to listen to us, that Jesus cares for us, that Jesus is real. Jesus still heals today, just like he did yesterday, and he will continue to heal today and tomorrow. My wife receive her healing, and Jesus gets all the glory. Amen, church? Can we shout, Jesus gets all the glory. Amen. So I want to encourage all of you who are listening. If you are going through difficult times because of this pandemic or otherwise, if you are going through struggles in your life, I want to encourage you to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Keep confessing His promises. Keep talking to Him. Keep believing in Him. And you know what? One of the key verses in our story is John chapter 11, verse 40. It says this, If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Amen? Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Lazarus. We thank you for my wife's and my story. Now, Lord, I believe that you have a story for everyone else there that's listening this morning. Lord, you said there'll be difficult times in our lives. There'll be tribulations. There'll be hard times. We know this. This is life on earth because we live in a broken world. But Lord, for those who are struggling right now, I pray that they will never give up, that they will never abandon their faith, Remind them that you care for them. If they walk in obedience to your word, Lord, let them know in their spirit that you are their friend because they walk in obedience. And Lord, as friends, we know that you will never leave them for, nor forsake them. You are the best friend any person in this life can ever have. So right now I pray, Lord, that whoever is out there that they continue to stand firm in your faith. Lord, let them dwell in your promises. Let them learn from the lessons that we learned today, that you care for them, that you love them, that you fulfill your promises, and that we are here as instruments to let everyone know through our lives that you are alive. And when you deliver us, when you deliver them, our prayer is that we will always give you the honor, the praise, and the glory that you deserve. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, Thrive Church. And at this point in time, we'd like to uh, invite everyone to open their hearts for a time of worship. Can we give God a big hand, a big shout in this place together right now? Oh, come on, I know there's more in you than that. Give God all of your praise in this place today. Praise God. I want to thank Pastor Bond for courageously sharing from his life this powerful story of the way that God worked in his life, in his family's life, in his wife Arlene's life. And I want to thank him so much today. It's just, it just goes to show that nothing is impossible with God. And that with God, miracles are possible. That God is a God of miracles. And the greatest miracle of all was when we 
could not reach God on our own, when it was impossible for us to get to God because of our sin, because of the things that we've done. God didn't leave us. He didn't abandon us. He didn't quit on us. Instead, what did he do? He reached for us and he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins and to rise again from the grave to conquer our two biggest problems in life. What are those two biggest problems? The first biggest problem is our sin. If you're here and you realize you need forgiveness for something you said, something you did, a decision you made, a thought that you had, and you realize that you need that forgiveness, you want assurance of that forgiveness, then I want to lead you to a prayer in just a moment where you can accept the forgiveness that Jesus paid on the cross to make possible for you and for me. And the second problem that Jesus paid for or solved for us was when he rose from the grave, he showed that death has no hold over him. And so if you're here in this place and you're not sure where you're going to go after you die, or you're not really sure, you know, where are you going to be? Are you going to go to heaven? Are you going to go to hell? Are you, where, where are you going to be? If, you, if you're scared of death, remember Jesus' words. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. It's because in Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness for our sins. And in Jesus Christ, we have hope that is stronger than death, such that you can know where you go after you die. You can have a peace and an assurance in your heart that you are sick citizen of heaven because Jesus Christ is in your life. And so if that's you today and you need the assurance of being forgiven of your sins, or you need the assurance of knowing where you're going to go after you die, that you belong to God, that you are a citizen of heaven, that you're going to go to where Jesus is after you die, then I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me right now as a response to God, as it is an expression of us saying we need God. Would you just lift up your hand wherever you are right now? And let the height of your hand reflect how much you need God today. And as the music is playing, as I'm getting ready to lead you in prayer, would you pray this prayer with me right now. You can say, Dear Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross to pay for my sins, that you rose again to give me eternal life. So right now, I open up my heart. Please come in, forgive me of my sins, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, come on. Give God a big, big hand, a big shout in this place right now. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that from your heart, would you just press that button that's on your screen right now that says, I commit my life to Jesus? Or you can text the word believe to 604-285-5770. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that from your heart, then according to the Bible, you are forgiven of your sins because of Jesus. You have eternal life and hope beyond the grave because of Jesus. You're a child of God. You're a citizen of heaven. You're a priest in God's kingdom. All because of Jesus. And because of Jesus, you can say the best is yet to come. And we would love it if you would you know, press that button that says, I commit my life to Jesus, or again, text believe to our phone number. And when you do so, we will connect you with some resources to help you take that next step in your journey with God, to encourage you, help you, and better take, in, to make the most of the decision that you made today. A big congratulations to each and every one of you who made that call today, who made that prayer today. Finally, today, one thing we want to do is one thing we learned from Pastor Bond's message is that when we take the time to seek God's face, it really makes a difference. That when we take God's t time to seek God's face, it can lead to breakthroughs in our lives that we couldn't manufacture on our own. It makes room for God to work in only ways that he can. And if you're here and you realize you need a touch from God as we enter into a new month in September, if you realize that there is a breakthrough that you need in your life, maybe in your marriage, your career, your finances, in some other way, and you're needing a breakthrough, or you just want to make more room for God to work in your life, and, and you're curious about this fasting thing, and you want, you want to see what this is all about, and you want to experience it with your church family, can I encourage you right now, right now, don't wait till tomorrow. Would you you sign up right now at mythought.info and would you press that button that talks about our church wide fast sign up we're gonna email to you a guide to fasting so you can know how to do this fast in a healthy and a safe way and it's gonna be such an amazing time you do not want to miss it if you're here and you've never fasted before this is a great way to get acquainted with the idea of fasting encourage those who have fasted with us before to do so again because we've seen God do powerful things when we fast together if you believe us say amen and so I encourage you to sign up even right now. Do that right now. Do that right now. And as we get ready to close off our service, we're going to do one final thing is if you call throughout church or home church or you just believe in the work that God is doing here, it's time to give our faithful tithes, our generous offerings. Know that when we seek God's kingdom first, he adds what? He adds 
He adds everything we need. Not only does God add everything we need, but he also builds his church through us as well, both here in Vancouver and around the world. And so I'm gonna encourage you right now to give uh, to faithfully those you call throughout church, your home church. Thank you so much for giving in advance. And uh, we're just gonna invite you to do that right now. And maybe before we hand the time back to our online host, let me just pray for you and let's just pray together right now. Heavenly Father, we wanna thank you so much for this amazing Sunday where we can draw near to you together. Thank you so much for this powerful message we heard from Pastor Bon about how nothing is impossible with you. And so for every single person right now who's facing a bit of a mountain in their lives, where they're facing a situation that they don't have a solution for, facing trouble that they don't have an answer for, thank you, God, that you are greater than their situation today. And because you are, we look to you and together we surrender that issue, that burden, that worry, that concern, that situation that's beyond our control into the hands of the one who is in control. And we give it all to you today. We say thank you, God, for each and every single person who's got their heart open to you right now as we pray. I pray all of your blessing, courage, strength, faith, joy, wisdom, comfort, healing, and your Holy Spirit to fill them until we next meet again. We thank you. We give you praise that because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and he rose again from the grave, the best is yet to come. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What an amazing Sunday it is to be with you. Mwah. We love you guys, church. You guys are awesome. Praise God. The best is yet to come. Have a great Sunday, everybody. We're going to hand it back to our online host. Have an awesome start to the brand new week. God is with you. The best is yet to come. Take care, everybody. See you soon. Thank you, Pastor Bond, for sharing your pivotal moment with us. Before I let you guys go, I have a few announcements. If it's your first time here, you're a VIP, so please let us know by texting NEW at 604-285-5770 and we will mail you your very own Thrive Stainless Steel water bottle. If you made the choice to receive Jesus Christ into your life today, congratulations, we have a gift package that we want to mail specifically to you as well as a series of videos that may answer some questions that you have about Jesus. So just text BELIEVE at 604-285-5770. Join us for our Thrive Churchwide Fast happening Tuesday, September the 1st. Fasting is a great way for you to make more room for God to work in your lives. I know fasting can sound very daunting at first, and for me personally, yes, it was very difficult, but it was the perfect way to remove all distractions and focus my attention fully on God. At the end of the day, it was a really rewarding experience. I know you will like it too, so sign up with me and other Thrivers at MyThrive.info. Don't forget to tune in every Tuesday at 8.30 p.m. for our Zoom prayer meetings. Join us for a time of prayer and worship. For more information, visit our Facebook or Instagram. So that's it for this week. I hope you all have a great day. Don't forget to give your tithes and offerings, and I'll see you all next week here at Thrive Church Online. 